Um, all right, and I'll move to introduce um, the speaker of today. I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Veronica Waweru, who is um, the convener of this conference. Um, Dr. Veronica Waweru is an archeological anthropologist who studies human origins in East Africa. Her work centers on prehistoric behavioral and technological adaptations spanning the last 500,000 years at the Kenya Highlands, Turkana Basin, and the Athikapiti Plains. Dr. Waweru also works with rural communities in Kenya to understand how they perceive human evolution science and consume the products of prehistory research carried out in the country. She further explores the social and health impacts of Darwinian evolution, scientific racism, and colonialism on Africans. At Yale, Dr. Waweru teaches courses in research methods, social dimensions of evolution, and Swahili. She has extensive experience working as a researcher with the National Museums of Kenya, lecturer at Southern Connecticut State University, visiting research professor at the physics department at the University of Connecticut, visiting assistant professor and field school director at Stony Brook University in, in New York. And she currently um, is a lecturer and director of African, of she is currently a lecturer and director of undergraduate studies at Yale's Council on African Studies. The title of her talk today is The Cradle Paradox in Africa, a Decolonial Approach to the Study of Ancient Heritage. She will speak for about 30 minutes and we'll take questions for the last 15 minutes um, of the session. You're welcome to enter the questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen anytime during the talk and we'll get to them at the end. Over to you, Veronica. Thank you, Nora. Um, first of all, before I, I bring up my slides, and I have quite a few slides, I would like to um, talk about you know how I started um, working on you know on decolonizing heritage. I, as Nora mentioned, I have um, been a practicing archaeologist for a very a very long time. I study um, human evolution in East Africa, and in particularly technology. Um, at, at the emergence of our own species, um, Homo sapiens. But after doing this for very many years, I, I became very uncomfortable um, with how we were extracting, you know, and using the knowledge about human origins, um, you know, in, in Kenya in particular. So I, we, we would be at field excavation sites and we would carry out our science um, you know, come in, you know, four-wheel vehicles, uh, four-wheel drive vehicles and, you know, all kinds of fancy equipment and we'd hire a few local people. Um, and most of the time we'd try and, you know, shoo them away from our sites. And with time it began to bother me. And that is why I, I started this um, community um, engagement aspect of, of human evolution. Um, Nora, I think I'm, I'm going to share my screen now. Um, so give me a second, please. So after, after um, again, practicing archaeology, and I, I came to realize there's this, you know, essentially something not right um, with this whole status of, you know, of Africa as a credo status. And when I say something not right, I mean that, you know, a lot of the people that I know, and I came to find out really in sub-Saharan Africa, don't quite understand this credo status. Um, so in, in, in the psyche of many Africans, this doesn't hold, you know, any importance. If anything, if anything, they run away from this idea of Africa as the cradle. Why is it not a, a point of pride for Africans, at least most Africans? Um, let's, let, let me not say all of them. And so this idea that Africa should, has this great claim to fame, that, you know, it is the origins of, you know, it is the homeland of, of humans, you know, and humans everywhere in the world. Um, evidence does show that. Um, but we distance ourselves from it. And, you know, a lot of us, you know, will make um, that one time visit to the museum, if ever. And usually we do this as kids and you go to the museum, there are these dioramas of um, ape men reconstruction. And the idea that this is your ancestor, the, you know, this hairy, you know, um, dark apes. Um, the idea that that is your, is your heritage is a little, you know, problematic. 
and hence the, the, the credo paradox. Um, so what I've done is um, I have incorporated in my own human evolution studies work, um, you know, decoloniality approaches, you know, to, you know, to those products of human evolution. And so that, that is going to be the focus of my talk. I'm going to give a little bit of background on some of these issues, um, especially for, um, for the non-specialist audience, I, I, because I hope, I, I really hope to, you know, to reach as many people as, as possible. Um, so when you talk about the, the products of evolution, when you talk about the, the products of evolution, um, these are highly consumed in, in the West. Um, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them are sourced from, you know, from Africa. And um, this is what um, people in the West consume. Um, they get to know about, you know, the latest finds. Um, but they still, when we as Africans get, um, at least most Kenyans that I know of, get a very, very filtered idea of human evolution. Um, so again, what we see are this ape men reconstruction and that, you know, this ape men somehow um, appeared in Africa. And there's this sense that, you know, for the, for, the, for the humans that left Africa, it was not more about living, but it was more about escaping Africa. And that the people who are left in Africa are more or less, you know, this evolutionary relics, um, ape men or, you know, people who are somewhere lower on the evolutionary ladder. And again, because of the way these products are consumed in, in, in Africa, again, very, very few of them are shared. And when they are shared, again, a lot of context is missing. So we tend to distance ourselves from this. Um, so what do, what do we want to do about this? And why is it important? Um, why is addressing or understanding the credo paradox important? Um, so the, another thing I want to touch on is when we talk about, you know, human evolution, it's, it's, it's considered a science. And we, again, in Africa, we've, you know, we've taken science, we, you know, we, we public health issues, um, including, you know, understanding things like the mutation of, you know, of the coronaviruses, um, various mutations that we've seen, that is evolution happening. Um, so we have taken on science, we have taken on science, but this aspect of science that deals with you know the Darwinian um, origins of humans, um, it's something that we have a very uncomfortable um, uncomfortable relationship with. And then um, also to you know to bring up the idea of science um, because I'm, I'm going to be addressing that the idea of of science, and you know we as Africans you know kind of decolonizing that science and deconstructing the existing paradigms of doing science. Science has always been viewed or something, um, you know, sacrosanct, something that, you know, there's no either or, we, you know, there's only one way of doing science. And that is one of the things that, you know, I'm going to be um, challenging today. So, um, you know, some of my colleagues may see this and kind of think you want to mess with, you know, human evolution science, you want to mess with Darwinian science. Um, I will not be the first one to do this. People have corrupted it, but the way I'm using it is not in a corrupt way. I am I'm simply trying to address some of the issues that um, have led to this science being misused a lot and misinterpreted. So um, just to start, I have, you know, I, I have a few images here. And the, the picture on the left is from last year. Um, that, that was um, the, a, field, um, a field project in, in Mount Kenya West in Kenya. Um, this is in the Highlands. And we, um, we are investigating, you know, the cultural material remains of, you know, of homo sapiens um, and earlier homo sapiens, archaic homo sapiens. And we're very excited to, you know, th that, you know, we, we are working in a new area outside of the Rift Valley, which is a traditional area where, you know, a lot of human remains in Eastern Africa have been found. Um, I do not have a picture here that would show what this would ideally look like in you know, presentations, you know, um, at scientific conferences of the participants. Um, again, I wouldn't want to I don't know, scandalize anybody here or shame anyone, but the typical image that appears at the end of a presentation is usually a few um, local manual laborers and then a whole, you know, like the, the Western um, researchers. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And I'm saying that as somebody who has benefited from, you know, a scholarship in, in a Western university to study human evolution and been very lucky to be able to, to work in Kenya. 
and you, you're seeing all of these individuals and this is not your traditional image that you'd see at the end of of um, PowerPoint presentation about you know some wonderful discoveries and wonderful work done in in East Africa or at least I know in Kenya. Um, what is interesting is that this time is this work is is being done by mostly indigenous um, you know researchers. We may be living out of the country, uh, or most of us may be living out of the country. Um, but in here, some of the people are not here. You you have you know six um, you have six Kenyan PhD, um, three females and and um, three males. Um, I mean, as much as we have, you know, the American institutions represented here, you can see, you know, Massa University and Yale. Um, this is this is something that is not a common sight. Um, so we also have local people. Um, we have some, you know, we have some master's students. We have someone who just finished eighth grade and is going to, you know, was about to enter high school um, this year. And we also have, um, you know the, the 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 guy on the right side who's holding the camera equipment that is just um someone who was interested in we mentioned the work to him and he's you know he's um an acquaintance and he was really interested and he showed up um so what i'm saying is we do need to you know to kind of change the paradigm of who who, who does you know work on human origins and what difference does it make that you have this you know you know, indigenous local researchers. Um, what difference does it make to how we we um, talk about the products of you know human evolution research and you know how we we present um, these products? Um, and 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 one of the things that you know you would probably you know this is this is a big deal to me because I see very relaxed faces. Um, some of the other images that I've seen is that you have this. A group of very uncomfortable looking you know locals and 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 again you have all the western researchers um but again this was a very it, it you can tell that the you know the, the chemistry is different the atmosphere is different um and so what, what the local person does for us um the local photographer is he's he's gonna take a lot of images he's gonna share this you know on social media he's gonna talk to his family and the way he portrays um you know Kenya or Africa as a cradle of you know humankind is going to be very different from um, what a person would get by looking you know at, at an image of an ape man reconstruction. Um, anyway, so I'm um, very quickly. What is it is a cradle paradox? And again, I apologize for the text, but I, I thought it was important that I laid this in background. So. Um, Africa, based on evidence, not conjecture, it's, it's um, Africa is a cradle of humankind, and you have human ancestors or human-like ancestors appear here seven million years ago. Um, these Africans later moved to other parts of the world um, in multiple movements. Um, but what is also more important is modern Homo sapiens, modern humans, still emerge from Africa. Um, so again, a lot of us um, distance ourselves from the status of Africa as a cradle of humanity um, or humankind. Uh, and, and again, many of us prefer um, religion's origins narratives, including the Garden of Eden orientation, while others will identify with, you know, kind of syncretic or an amalgamation of, you know, you know of religions, um, of religious nar narratives. And so um, when we are caught in this kind of syncretic spaces, we, religious spaces, we are, we, we are in this liminal spaces. We are not, you know, we are not within our traditions. We are not within um, the Western, you know, um, ideas of human origins, be, be it human evolution or be it, um, you know, Christianity. So I, I guess some of the, you know, the, the larger questions that emerge here today, um, uh, do products of prehistory research influence African identity? Um, so paleont paleoanthropology um, has, you know, has epistemological anchoring in Western scientific work. What is the problem with that? And especially since there's this idea that, you know, it's science and it's modern, you know, don't mess with it. Um, the other key issue is agency. Does it matter if people have agency in the formulation of their own identities? Um, so. And, and when you talk about the African identity, that is something that has, you know, that has also been widely discussed in, you know, by people, you know, like um, William Idowu. Um, 
Um, Nora, I have a question for you. Can you see the new images or can you see the slides changing, even if they're tiny? No, we're still on the third slide. Oh, wow. Well. That is okay. I'm, I'm going to just keep talking. Um, so what, what has been going on is that, you know, African researchers, you know, have been, you know, subalterns in, you know, when it comes to human origins research in Africa. And, and what happens is there's also when it comes to the, you know, this it's citizens of African countries, especially sub-Saharan African countries, there's, as I mentioned earlier, a donation of you know, some products of, of research. Um, so more questions. Who determines what is studied about Africa's recent and remote past? Um, a lot of the time that has not been, you know, you know Africans. Um, who, dis who determines what, you know, paradigms are used? Uh, what are the power dynamics between Western and indigenous researchers? And, and, and finally, how are products of prehistory research shared with the local communities? So if again, if the research simply goes to, to journals and publications and books, and as some of the earlier speakers said, um, you know, it just shared within an you know, elite academics and these products are not making any, any impact on the ground. Um, or at, in this case, I'd rather say they're not making any positive impact. If anything, um, people will visit the museum, they are going to see those dioramas, see the Aikman reconstruction, and that is not a very appealing image. Um, so the other image of, you know, made in the likeness of, of God is what's not to like about that? Um, compare, you know, you know, being compared to an ape and, you know, being made, made in the image and likeness of God, uh, I think that the choice is, is fairly clear here. So one of the other things that I'm doing is, um, you know, apart from describing what the creator paradox is, um, and this is something that I've been exploring for a while, it's I'm, I'm, I'm exploring the use of, you know, the, the creator paradox as a conceptual tool. So there's saying what it is, and there's also, you know, how it can help us address, you know, some of the problems that come with um, the corruption of Darwinian science um, and how it has been applied to, to Africans. Uh, in my teaching of, um, of the social dimensions evolution class, which I developed, you know, once I recognized that there's a major gap in the way um, human origins Darwinian science is taught and how, and, you know, and there's how, how it is, it impacts people. Um, one of the things that, you know, my, my students raised and, um, you know, I've really been excited about that class because it's very, very interactive is that we have not, we teach the science, we teach the science of evolution, of human evolution, but we don't teach the science, how that science has been misused, how it's been, you know, misapplied to marginalize people, um, to dehumanize people. And, um, and, and, and that is something that is, you know, has been solely working. So um, the other thing is that anthropology, you know, anthropology's origin, um, original sin rather is that it was seen as a study of the primitive. And as much as people in academia think that we've moved on past that, we've moved on past the, you know, Darwinian, you know, the, the corruption of Darwinian science, have we really? Um, because we've moved on maybe in the, you know, in the academic spaces, but what about the social spaces? What are the remnants of that corruption of Darwinian science? And just to give you an example, not even from Africa, you know, um, how when, when we abuse Darwinian science, um, eugenics, the eugenics movements in, in movement in this country um, was again based on just bad Darwinian science or a corruption of it. And it led to the sterilization of many, many people. Um, Hitler himself borrowed um, a book from, you know, from the United States on, you know, on sterilization, you know, for race betterment. Um, so, the misuse of Darwinian science has real consequences for people. So again, anthropology and its sub subdisciplines, including archaeology, um, prehistory, that is prehistory, um, prehistoric technology and material culture, and paleontology, study of fossil remains, have been misused to other Africans. And again, to go back to my to my um, class, the, the students, you know, wanted to make a distinction between the cultural othering and what they called biological othering. And what is biological othering here? Yeah, the best example here 
is, you know, the use of animalization when you, you know, you compare um, human beings to some, you know, other animals that are considered lower on the evolutionary, you know, rung of, you know, of, of you know, of a ladder. And case in point here is a, the ape insult. Um, So these are just some some of the corollaries of the credo paradox. They are not they are not necessarily um, um, exhaustive, and I'm going to mention um, a couple of them. Um, the first one is identity. Who are you? You know, as an African, and you know, and how should you? You know, um, more importantly, relate to non-Africans. Um, and and this is important because we. We, we have been, you know, when the Darwinian science, the, the corruption of the Darwinian science, you know, um, kind of, you know, say that, you know, we are these lesser human beings, we are at a lower stage of, you know, development, and we are yet to, you know, to reach, you know, the epitome of, you know, advancement, that, that, is, that is a problem. Um, the, issues of, the issues of modernity, um, what is a modern African? Um, when you are considered as not quite human, um, and and all of your you know all of your identity all of your cultural practice is seen as as not quite up to par to you know um, with everybody's everybody and else's um, stage. So what does that mean? And for what modernity, what happens is that we try very hard. We try very hard to be seen as modernity and to get all the trappings of modernity. And that has been one of the things that is, has been our, our undoing. And one of the things we do with modernity is dispense with our indigenous um, knowledge systems. Um, another you know, example of that is the concept of beauty. Um, again, we have not been just based on, on Western standards of beauty. We, we, ha we have had some people who really see their own you know, skin color as you know, a pathology, something that needs to be fixed. Um, there have been other issues like, you know, things to do with the race and IQ and race and, you know, propensity to violence. So they, and, and we see this every day. As much as, you know, we, we in, the, in, the, in the academic spaces don't like acknowledging this, people in the streets, you know, experience this day. The idea that, a, you know, a black man is seen as, a, you know, a threat, someone who can easily, you know, become very violent. And if someone calls the police, they're not just going to say, I'm being threatened by a man, but it has more of an impact if I say I'm being threatened by a black man, for example. Um, so let's talk about, you know, um, again, I'm gonna go to, you know, specific examples very quickly. Um, the social dimensions of evolution, rampant, rampant skin bleaching, particularly in women in Africa. In countries like um, Nigeria, it's at close to 73%. Um, Kenya, about 35%. South Africa, about 34%. What causes us to, you know, to bleach our skin and what beauty ideal are we going for? I mean, you can easily argue that, you know, this is just, you know, a preference. Um, but when you look at issues of colorism in Africa and here in the United States or the African diaspora, there's there's a deeper problem, you know, with the skin bleaching. Again, it's one of those things that have, you know, that really come with, um, at, at least I argue here with um, just the the mis the earlier misuse of Darwinian evolution and Africans being compared to apes and and we being expected to rise up to what was considered modern and um, animalization. Again, I meant I, I talked about that constant um, ape insults. You know, I'm talking here about the social dimensions of evolution outside of, you know, the academy. Um, soccer players, you know, of, of color in, in Europe, for example, getting bananas thrown at them. Um, so all of these insults. And, um, and I just, just to give you an, another common quote, which is um, very, you know, worrisome because it's coming from a scientist. This is Dr. Watson. Um, he is a core discoverer of DNA, um, 1962 Nobel um, prize winner. Um, so in 2007 and 2019, he, you know, he comments on, you know, on race and IQ, and he told the um, London Sunday Times magazine that there were many um, people of color who are very talented. He was, however, inherently gloomy about the prospect of Africa. And what does he mean by that? 
um, that the problems of Africa are really have, really have to do with you know, our genetics and that our genetics are not the same as those of Westerners um, in that they are inferior. And so that's why we, have, we appear to have these problems. So, and as much as I argue that the social dimensions of evolution are there, are mostly practiced by non-academics, by you know, people in the public sphere, it's even more worrisome when a scientist says this. Um, I mean, he, he did lose a lot of you know, awards and, and privileges, but the fact that he thinks this, how many other you know, scientists or people in the academy, in the academy think the same? Um, So community archaeology and prehistory. So what I argue here is that there's a need for collaboration between prehistory researchers, heritage managers, and the community. Um, and, and, and so this has, again, not happened much. Um, and so there's that disconnect, especially in, in the you know, remote um, heritage research, um, that we have this you know, wonderful, wonderful um, heritage going back to you know, all the way to 7 million years. Um, but because there's not, there has not been that um, participation, this heritage has served, you know, more of, it, it has had a negative impact on us. Um, and I, I have a quote from um, Professor Peter Schmidt, um, and he argues that when cultures in Africa participate in the interpretation of their own past, uh, we can begin to build a self-enriching tradition of archaeology, of prehistory, free from the domination of Western paradigms, and appropriate to African settings. Um, so, but why haven't this community, you know, um, prehistory efforts um, not gained traction? Um, so, and um, I'll just list them here. Community archaeology practice has not been standardized. Um, it's not a priority. It's, you know, community engagement is not a priority for researchers, majority of whom are Western. Um, local policy makers place little value on evolutionary studies. And remember these policy makers, whether they, they are you know, people in education or, or politicians, they are also you know, suffering from this credo paradox. They, um, they are very uncomfortable with this idea of evolution. And so if, if, if human evolution studies you know, don't get you know, the, the, the proper treatment um, in schools, um, what happens is, is that students end up with very skewed information. They end up with, you know, information that, you know, they, there's this cherry picking. So just the idea that you are descended from apes. No, we are not descended from apes. We are very, very distant relatives. We are not, otherwise we are not there. They're not our ancestors. Um, so again, let's think of, you know, things like um, in, in, in the apartheid regime in South Africa. If students um, don't understand, you know, what's, you know, what is the significance of having a dark skin color, why some people have, you know, a lighter skin color. Um, this, of course, was suppressed because it did not work, you know, with, with, you know, the regime's idea of, you know, of um, separating people by race. And so if a student doesn't know how to counter, you know, these racist ideas because they, they never learned about human evolution, then they might end up, you know, believing that having that darker skin is, you know, is something that's inferior. So, but if you can easily, and we've, you know, these conversations have come up when we're in the field. Um, when we tell people in, in these villages, as we are doing our excavations that, you know, all people are related. And then they'll ask why are some people white, others black, we'll tell them simply, if you live near, you know, in the tropics, near the equator, you need that dark skin to protect your skin from, you know, um, solar radiation, otherwise you're gonna get skin cancer. And people further away um, do not have that need. If anything, they need to maximize um, the solar radiation, if you've been in particular, to make vitamin you know, D on their skin. So once we explain this, it makes a lot more sense. And um, so again, human evolution dioramas, even in African museums, contain highly filtered information. The context is lacking. It's prone to misinterpretation and, of course, it, it, that leading to rejection of, of our remote heritage. So um, what then do we need to do? So we need, you know, uh, we need decolonial approaches to prehistory research. The first one is the de deconstruction of paradigms used in archaeological inquiry. And the second one is research practice aimed at interrogating meta-narratives with colonial scholar scholarly foundations. And so I'm looking at this larger um, um, archives of of knowledge that are in place. 
So what do I do in, in the field to address the, the, you know, the, the, the credo um, paradox? Um, I'm looking at this as both a decoloniality measure and um, as something of this, you know, social justice. So it's action-based. It's again, this again moves beyond. It's great that I'm able to, to develop a course and teach about this, but it's also um, important that this be, you know, be something that I'm doing on my part. Um, and again, we're going to have a discussion later about what, you know, what African, you know, knowledge systems mean. You know, does this mean something that has been there, that was there 400 years ago? We can come up with our own, with our own, you know, knowledge um, systems, our own way of doing things that work for, for now. Um, so it's something sort of action-based, is scalable to individual um, prehistory projects, does not require huge um, investments of money and time. It introduces evolutionary science in a bottom-up trajectory, and local communities can own the products of research and then attach social and scientific value to it. Um, so what we have done is we have involved people at, you know, on the ground. Uh, first, we engage local elders and community leaders. We seek their permission and cooperation. Um, we explain our work. Um, we give basic training in identifying artifacts and fossils, procedures you know, to follow if you find any of this, um, calling the National Museums, for example. Um, we also involve schools and other interested members in non-specialist tasks. Um, and then we get community members to work actively in our project. Um, so in, in a nutshell, what has happened as two field um, site projects, we have had a lot of community interest. We have, um, you know, we have given schools um, replicas of, you know, of fossils of human ancestors. And once they have that, you know, in chronological order, it makes more sense than them going to a museum and just, um, and, and seeing that they're wrong. And so um, just to, to quickly finish this, um, we have had great results. We have had amazing discussions on the ground with people, as I mentioned, in, including about skin color. Um, and very importantly, we have had, you know, one community member actually make a discovery of, you know, of an ancient human being dating to, you know, um, it's part of, of a skull, dating to 614,000 years. And he has also found, you know, multiple sites. And so that is, you know, active knowledge co-production. And that is my, my um, little way of, you know, of, you know, using the colonial approaches and, and kind of um, changing the way that we do, um, you know, we, we study um, human evolution. Um, so I know I've taken up a lot of time and I would like to open this up to a Q and A. Um, Thank you, Veronica. Um, the Q&A feature is open at the bottom of your screens if you want to field any questions to her. Um, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about the reception of your work on the, on the ground, particularly in you know, the places where you do archeological digs. And I know you've made intentional efforts to bring the locals into, um, into conversation with the work that's being done there. So I wonder if you can just talk a little bit more about how they've received um, your work and how they um, see themselves or don't see themselves as co-producers of this knowledge. Um, um, thank you, Nora. The, the, the reception was actually better than we expected. And, and just to give you a quick example, when we first met the elders in, in Narok in Kenya, you, you just can't go teaching evolution to their kids before you talk to, you know, to the local elders. And so we were a little scared because we're coming from church on a Sunday afternoon. That's the only time that we're available. You know, coming from church and then talking to them about evolution, it was, um, you know, it was it was a daunting task. But it turned out that they um, they were very they were very open. They were very open to you know to what we were doing. They were excited. They wanted to participate. They wanted to participate. It's funny that they were kind of the elders would look as as younger as, as younger people who need you know that help. Um, and they tell us, oh, when I was young, there's this cave we used to go to to slaughter you know hunted animals and. This is what we saw and I'd like to take you there. Um, we also came to learn a lot from them about um, the names of the plants in the environment and, and all the medicinal uses and how they interact with the environment. Um, they were also, they wanted to know if the makers of the stone tools that we found, for example, um, were Maasai like them, that's the Maasai ethnic group. And we told them no, and they could just see them pause. And so they said, so we were not the first people here. 
And that was a new recognition for them that there are other people that live there. And there was the evidence that there were other people that had lived there. So their reception has been, has been great. Um, but there's also the, they also they also want to, they want to be more involved. They some of them want a, a community museum, for example, in Mount Kenya, West, they want a community museum. Um, they want the ability to name the finds, and so that way they're also taking ownership. Um, okay, thank you for that. If any of the speakers have any questions for her, you're welcome to um, to ask. I think we have a question from Monica. Um, she says, I was wondering about the position of the local researcher you mentioned in the end of your talk. In what way is he or she remunerated? Isn't this still, an, still a continuity of extracting knowledge that you started your talk with? Um, that is actually a good question. Um, one of the things that, you know, we, we have these talks with them about what we expect and, you know, how much time they, they are going to put in and um, what they're bringing to the table that we do not have. So you know, one of the things they, they have this encyclopedic knowledge of, of their landscape. They know when it rains, we, you know, things, now we, that we've told them what we're looking for, things show up, you know, they get exposed. And so um, what we are doing for this one person, um, we are putting his son through high school. The, the, the kid that was, you know, this, you know, lanky kid that was in eighth grade um, last year, he started school this year, and what we are doing is we are putting his child, you know, that's the argument we've come to, and I, we thought that was, was the best way for, you know, for remunerating him that would have the best impact, so we're putting his son through high school. And I wonder, Veronica, if you could speak to, when the final product comes out, whether it's um, um, an artifact that ends up in a museum, or if it's a paper that's produced, what are the ways that you um, that you credit the people who have been working with you or, or giving you insights to their local environment in that final work? Um, th th that's that's actually that's an interesting question because crediting them, um, I mean, other researchers have done that. You you see, at, you know, at the end of their talks or in 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 their acknowledgments in the articles, they would say you know, participation of these, you know, wonderful local collaborators. Um, but for me, the best way to really credit them, because again, the, the museum has these kind of procedures on who can do what and who cannot do what. For, for me, the best way to, you know, to, to credit them is, you know, like what I'm doing here right now. Um, and I mean, we, we I didn't get to show you all of the images. Um, I let you know about who they are and about what they have, you know, they, they have contributed. I can um, I can do a paper on you know what local people can do and have done at least in my example and I think that's a better way of of crediting them um, than just um, beyond just you know paying them for you know, for, for their work and just mention mentioning them in an article at the end of an article. Any other questions? Um, let me just check here. Um, we have a few more. Maybe space for one more question, if there's any from the audience before we take a break. Um, here's one. Uh, Teferi Abeta just has a comment saying that he was at a meeting where an Ethiopian paleontologist raised similar concerns. So that's kind of actively happening in the field. Mm -hmm. um, and then Nanji Umo asks, to what extent has your work challenged Darwinianism? Ah, to what extent? Um, first of all, um, I, I think the most important is to, to highlight the, you know, the, how you know, corrupted Darwinian ideas from the 1800s and 1900s still have an effect. As I said, we, we, you know, we think that that's in the past, you know, it should no longer matter, we know that science has evolved, but it is still, you know, it still does, you know, it still does matter. Um, I'm not actually questioning Darwinian science per se, but it's how it's been, you know, misused and, and weaponized to, you know, to dehumanize people and de-socialize, you know, people. Um, but even after we've acknowledged, scientists acknowledge, you know, um, 
everybody comes from Africa, we are all, you know, related. Um, you still have those hangovers from that bad the winning science in the public in the West. And that comes from, you know, all of that bad science, all of the artifacts that are, you know, that were stolen from Africa, all of the um, living museums, for example, in Belgium, where they would actually have this reconstruction of African villages, you know, as, you know, how the primitive people live. Um, yeah, if, if, if even today, I mean, we can see that there is, um, in, in, and I'm sorry to bring up Ukraine, I know it's still, there's, you know, a sensitive point that, you know, someone is commenting how horrified they are that they're seeing refugees who are blonde and blue eyed. And they, the idea out there is that those are not problems of the West, those are problems of, you know, other races. Um, yeah, so it's not about fixing Darwinian science, but highlighting how Darwinian science has been corrupted and weaponized against Africans. Thank you so much, Veronica. Thank you for taking all those questions and thank you for your talk. Um, thank you to our participants for joining us. Um, we are going to take a brief, uh, a short break, about a 30 minute break. Um, we'll be back at 1.15 p.m. Eastern. Um, I know that's different times depending on where you are um, globally, but we will be right back for about three more sessions for the afternoon. <laughs>